You know, when I, was a, when I was a little kid, I grew up going to church. We went to church every week. But my experience of church was light years away from what I believe God intends for us. I hated it. I hated going. It was always a chore. It was something we had to do because that's just what you did. You know, you, you're, you're a good Christian, so you go to church at least on Sunday morning. I mean, we hardly ever went on Wednesday night. Only a handful of people ever went on Wednesday nights. And Sunday night, you know, it was the same deal. You know, nobody much went on Sunday. A few people maybe, but most people, you know, but as long as you went on Sunday morning, I mean, you were good. You were, you, you were, you were, you were keeping the rules, you know, you were doing what you were supposed to do. And, you know, we, as kids, we had to dress up and we knew going to church, you know, we had to, we had to sit there with our parents and we had to be quiet and, and, Listen to the same boring stories week after week after week after week after week. And that, I mean, that was my perspective. I, I never remember learning anything that would help me navigate life or, you know, the, the examples that I saw kind of taught me that, listen, this is just about escaping the fires of hell. You know, you just need to pray that prayer so you don't go to hell. And what you do with the rest of your time, the rest of your life, well, that doesn't really matter. And I know the, the, the preacher never said that. But it was kind of what I understood because of the way I saw the adults living. You know, they did the rituals, but that was really it. The rest of the week, the rest of their lives, I mean, I'm not that they were bad people. I'm not saying that they were, you know, all living as though they didn't believe in God at all. That's, that's not what I mean. But it was just kind of almost like a wink and a nod toward God, you know. It was not something that really impacted anybody's life, as far as I could see. And I never heard anything or understood anything regarding the person of the Holy Spirit and, and, and the power that He imparts to the believer so that they can live now. See, that was the part that, well, Later on, as I began to study the Bible for myself, as I began to understand, you know, after, after I actually met Jesus, and a lot of it really had to do with my Aunt Linda and seeing how God impacted her life and seeing, seeing how, you know, the, I mean, I, it's, you know, it's the first time I really remember hearing about the Holy Spirit, I think, was, was from her. I'm not saying it's the first time that I did hear. I'm saying it's the first time I really remember hearing. And I didn't understand it. I mean, I was smoking pot all the time and high, and, but she started talking about the Holy Spirit. And, and it was in a very personal way. You know, he was doing stuff. He was teaching her things, and, and it, it got my attention. But, you know, as a kid, I just I saw a lot of the Christian religion, but I didn't see anything uh, of Christ's power. And, and then later on, you know, as a new Christian, as a young believer in, in, in my mid-20s, let's say, you know, I got, when I first became, a, a, you know, really became a Christian, and I was baptized as a kid, like I said, I went to church and everything, but I walked away from all of that, and I, I, I didn't really do anything, I didn't, didn't really have any kind of um, church life or, or, or anything for years and years and years, and, th and then in my mid-20s, when I when I actually had an encounter with the Lord Jesus, and I began looking for a church. And I found this little charismatic church, and it was, listen, God really used it in my life. But it was, it was just, um, uh, you know, this little charismatic fellowship, and, 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 and I started moving in those circles, you know, among the, the charismatic Pentecostal churches and everything. And, and to be honest, I, for years, I, I just, I saw a lot of fake stuff. And... But I was, I was afraid to call it that at the time because I didn't, like, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to be guilty of, of judging or, 
or doubting or anything like that. But I saw a lot, looking back at it, I saw a lot of fake stuff, fake healings and, and you know, just, just foolishness, a lot of emotionalism being paraded around as supernatural power. And I remember thinking it was a lot like you know, when, when I played high school football and, you know, the coach would try to, he'd, you know, give us a pep talk and he would get us all pumped up and, you know, and it was that way. And that, that's what I saw in the name of a move of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a move of the Holy Spirit. It was a bunch of emotionalism. It was, it was just a lot of hype. A lot of people crying and shouting and jumping up and down and working it up, you know, and, and, you know, being slain in the spirit. And listen, I, you know, I saw a lot of that kind of stuff. And, and I'm not saying that, that none of it was real. I'm not saying that, that none of it was genuine. People, you know, I mean, I've, listen, I've had encounters with the Holy Spirit that were just so overwhelming that I thought I was going to pass out. So I, 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 I get it. But I've also had an awful lot of preachers try to push me down. Literally, you know, try to force me to fall out. Listen, th- we have to be so discerning that, 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 for example, being slain in the Spirit, that, you don't see that anywhere in the Bible. That is nowhere in the Scriptures. It's become a tradition. It, it's, it's a really solidly entrenched tradition within Pentecostal charismatic churches, but it's nowhere in the Bible. You don't see it anywhere in the Scripture. And, and, and you and I need to be careful about that stuff. Now, listen, the thing that I began to notice as, as I grew in my faith was that there was something that I didn't see a lot of that is clearly in the Bible. In fact, it's what the Bible tells us is the chief mark of a life that's overflowing with the Spirit of God. That chief mark, according to the Bible, is, is love. That, that selfless, sacrificial, agape, Christ-like love. An active, holy compassion and concern for the, the people around me who are hopeless many times, helpless. They're, they're, they're spiritually lost. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Bible tells us that is the most important thing. It, it, the rest is of no value. It's many times we, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe because we're so prone to hyperbole ourselves, we, we miss the fact that the Bible doesn't do hyperbole. The Bible doesn't exaggerate. And the Bible says, if there's not love, then the rest of it's worthless. You got nothing if love is not at the root. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul, he's writing to these Corinthian believers who were, you know, man, they were over the top with the the expression of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. In other words, he says it doesn't matter if it doesn't matter how eloquent you are. It doesn't matter if you're speaking literally the language of the angels. If if it's not in love, well, then it's just like somebody clanging a cowbell. I mean, it's it's just a racket. It's just a bunch of of fruitless noise. And then he goes on, verse two: Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. Isn't that amazing? He's, he, he's, he says, even if, even if I am omniscient, even if I have all knowledge and I can predict the future, I know all the mysteries, have all faith so that I could literally remove mountains from their place. If I don't have love, I'm nothing. And he goes on, although I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Even the, 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 the ultimate personal 
sacrifice of, of, of martyrdom, being burned for your faith. If it's not in love, it doesn't profit you anything. Listen, life for a, a true, a sincere follower of Jesus, it, it'll become a mission, a mission that's marked by his love and marked by his power. Not just a life of ritual or religious activities, but a life of surrender to his plan and purpose for the individual, born out of a genuine faith in his person. So, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, who is he talking about? Remember, there were 120 of them, roughly, the Bible says, somewhere around 120 followers of Jesus. And that's who he's talking about. What is this thing about when the day of Pentecost had fully come? Well, remember, in the book of Genesis, in that record of the beginning, the Bible tells us that the way, it wor- the way it words it is that the evening and the morning marked the first day. Evening and morning, second day. That in the Hebrew mind, in the Jewish mind, and in, in the scriptures, what we see is that the day actually begins at sunset, not sunrise. We th- we think, in our minds in the Western world, we think sunrise is the beginning of the day. Well, in their mind, it, the beginning of the day was actually when the sun went down. You started your day with rest. You started your day at sundown. The, the, the feast days, the Sabbath days began at sunset. And that's why even now, you know, as here in Miami Beach, we have a lot of Jewish neighbors and friends. And, you know, uh, the, the Sabbath day begins Friday evening at sunset. Now, Pentecost began that evening at sunset. It was actually Thursday evening at sunset. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, so now, you know, we're Friday morning, they're all gathered together. Why were they gathered together? Well, because God had had given to Israel three major feasts every year at which or for which all of the men, all of the adult males in Israel were commanded by God to gather in Jerusalem. This, these feasts, these three feasts were to be celebrated in Jerusalem, if at all possible. And he made allowances in the loft. They've scattered all over the place, which they had. So if they lived too far away and they couldn't make it, um, they, they couldn't make the trip all the way to Jerusalem for all three feasts, well, then just try, at least try to make it for one every year, if, if at all possible. Um, but if, if they lived in the area, they had to be there. They had to go. They were required to go for all three of these major feasts. And Pentecost was one. The, the first of those mandatory Jewish feasts was Passover. Now, the, the day of Passover was right before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So you had the day of Passover... Again, that was on a Thursday, and then you had on, on Friday the, um, the day of, the, or the, the Sabbath day that marked the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that Feast of Unleavened Bread went all the way through the following Sabbath. So it was like nine days, and they all kind of got lumped together in our thinking. But at, at Passover, Passover was about remembering that when, when God sent Moses to bring them out of Egypt, and he you know, he, he told him that last, you know, expression of his wrath there in Egypt. He, he, he told him, sacrifice a lamb and on, on the, uh, take the blood of that, of that lamb and put it on the, the doorposts and the, and the lentils of your house. And, and so I'll pass over your house um, and, and not bring death. But if there's not blood, if the blood of the lamb is not on the doorpost, if I don't see the blood of the lamb on the, the lintel and the doorpost of your house, then every firstborn of that house will die, even, even, as, you know, even to Pharaoh. So um, the, the Passover lamb pointing toward Jesus. And, and it, we need to not miss the fact that 
this was deliberate on the part of God. Jesus was then crucified on the morning of Passover. So you've got all these people gathered together for this mandatory feast, and this man who has claimed to be their king, their Messiah, is crucified, and everybody is aware of it. Now, the, the next mandatory feast was the Feast of Pentecost. It began 50 days after the Passover, and it was, it was a feast celebrating the harvest. It was a feast of thanksgiving where they would offer to the Lord the first fruits of that year's harvest. They would go and just harvest like a portion, a corner of, of, of the field, whatever, then they would bring it to the temple and, and they would, you know, the priests would do a wave offering and they would offer the first fruits to the Lord. And, and that's when Pentecost, see, it's when the first fruits of the church were born of the Holy Spirit there in Jerusalem, fulfilling that prophetic element. Because remember, all these things, as we'll see in a moment, all these things pointed toward Jesus. The third mandatory feast where everybody had to gather in Jerusalem is a Feast of Tabernacles. And they celebrated at the Feast of Tabernacles, they celebrated leaving behind that 40-year wilderness journey where they lived in tabernacles, tents. And that one hasn't been fulfilled yet. I believe that one will finally be fulfilled at the rapture of the church when we leave these earthly tents, these physical bodies behind, and we're clothed with new bodies, Im immortal, eternal bodies. But, but see, the, the fact that God designed the feasts this way, you know, these three mandatory feasts where, you know, he commanded the Jewish men to gather in Jerusalem for these feasts, it, it, it meant that hundreds of thousands of people were gathered together in Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified and when he rose again. They all heard about it. Pentecost, 50 days later, hundreds of thousands of people were gathered together to celebrate, to feast. Think about it. For us, it's like our Thanksgiving holiday. That's what Pentecost is to the Jewish people, and it was 2,000 years ago. The same thing. It's like Thanksgiving. Man, everybody goes home for Thanksgiving. Well, everybody goes to Jerusalem for Pentecost. That's the idea. They're all gathered together. When the Holy Spirit is poured out just like Joel the prophet had prophesied in Joel chapter 2 verse 28. So God had set things up from the beginning so that the good news concerning the Messiah, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit would spread quickly all over the world as the Jews who were there in Jerusalem went back home and told others about what had taken place. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul, writing about the Jewish feasts, he said, let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. In other words, all these feasts were, were like a shadow of what Jesus was going to do, what Jesus is, who he is unto. All of it pointed toward him, toward his coming, toward his crucifixion, toward his resurrection, and toward the outpouring of his spirit on all flesh, as Joel had promised. Now, I want to I wanna pause right here for a second because I want to give you an assignment you see, we're not going to be able to dig into this subject of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to be able to dig into it really, really deeply. We're going to, we're going to look at it a lot more next week, but I want to ask you to, to take the time. It's as simple as watching some videos. See, Pastor Chuck did 12, roughly 12 hours of teachings, 12 videos uh, many years ago when he taught the School of Ministry at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And those videos are available. They're f it's for free. You just, the, the link so that you can go um, to the website, the Word for Today website where they have those. The link is there in our Church Center app. All you have to do is go into the church app where, where we have today's notes and the discussion questions. There's a link there. 
and in our Calvary Chapel Miami Beach app. Um, and then you can go, and as you have time, you can watch, you know, those videos that will take you much deeper into a study of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the different gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given to the church. So I want to encourage you to take the time to, to do that. Now, going back to Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, listen, you, you got to remember the context. See, a, a week or one week earlier, Jesus had told them to wait in Jerusalem and they were going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you're going to be my witnesses. And, and he had promised them this. He had told them that this was going to be the case. And in this moment, when the Spirit of God overwhelmed them, poured himself upon them, overflowed them, they were changed. They were changed, every single one of them. Now, there, there were, the Bible tells us, approximately 120 men and women. It wasn't just the 11. It was the 11 plus a bunch of others who were present, and they were being obedient. They were just waiting like the Lord had told them to do. Now, we're going to notice three things here, if you're paying attention, because um, I'm not going to give them to you like one, two, three, but you'll notice three things that the Bible describes as having been observable. These were things that were tangible, things that, that people noticed. These guys, these men and women, they, they were just sitting there in this room waiting, like Jesus had told them, you know, it's it's first thing in the morning, as we'll see next week, as Peter talks about. It's first thing in the morning. They're sitting there, and all of a sudden, they hear this sound. And it sounds like a tornado or a hurricane or something, a mighty rushing wind. There was no wind, apparently. That there was only the sound. And then they saw something that they described as as being like a little flame of fire. And again, it's, it wasn't fire. It's not like all of a sudden there was fire in the room, you know, it's fire all over the room. It, was, it wasn't, it, but it was like this little, this little tongue that looked like a little flame, and, and it rested on each individual in the room, at which point they all began to speak aloud. Now, they spoke in other, it wasn't like God took over and they're all like zombies or robots or whatever. And no, no, no. They, they, they began to praise God, but not in their own languages. In glossa, that's the word that's used. It's translated unknown tongues. But it just, it just literally means they began to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance or prompted their speech. So it's like they, they just, all of a sudden, the Spirit of God came upon them in this powerful way. There was a sound, and they all see these little tiny, like, tongues that looked like fire, and they rested on every individual in the room, and, and they began to praise God. They began to speak of the wonderful works of God, but the words that came out were not words they knew. They were not it wasn't a language they had studied. It wasn't languages that they understood. Unknown tongues. At the feast, when the first fruits were celebrated, offered to God, the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, the beginning of His holy harvest took place. Verse 5 continues, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? 
Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Now, in just a minute, Peter's going to get up and tell them what it means. And we'll, again, <laughs> we'll get to that next week. But notice, there were seven, 17 different peoples, different nationalities mentioned here. Not all of them were Jewish. It makes it clear some were proselytes. In other words, some of them were non-Jewish people who had converted to Judaism. And the, the people in that upper room, the, apparently they got really loud. And down in the streets below, thousands of people were gathered together. Thousands of people heard them in their own languages, praising God, speaking of the wondrous works of God. And, and so, as we'll see next week, 3,000 people got saved that day and baptized. 3,000 people came to know the Lord Jesus. And what was the catalyst for all of this? Well, well, it was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which on this first fruits occasion was emphatically punctuated and marked by a mass expression of the gift of tongues. Now think about this with me. It's so important. So important. I don't, I don't want to overstate it, but, but, but you see, the gift of tongues has been much, it's been much maligned in the church. In, in other words, it's been spoken ill of. It, it's been disregarded. It's because it's been abused. Well, we're going to dig into this, God willing, next week and unpack a scriptural understanding of the gift of tongues. We're going to look at what the Bible teaches about the gift of tongues. But, but please, I don't, I don't want you to miss this. As we've already said, there, there were like 120, give or take, right, approximately 120 men and women gathered together in this room waiting on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this empowering that Jesus had promised they would receive. But I promise you, none of them were expecting it to happen this way. Now, why do I say that? Well, because nothing had been mentioned anywhere in the Bible about everybody beginning to speak God's praises in unknown tongues. That just wasn't, it wasn't part of the prescription. You know what I mean? That was not predicted anywhere. They weren't expecting this, but that's what happened. Why did it happen? Because God decided to do it that way. Almighty God, our all-wise, all-knowing, perfect Father chose to do it this way. When He was gathering together the first fruits of His harvest, when, when He was, if you will, breathing by His Spirit, breathing into existence, the body of Christ on earth, his church, he chose the gift of tongues by which to express his presence and his power. That's so significant. And if you can't see that, please, I would encourage you to pray and just talk to God about it. Ask him why he did it this way. Ask him. Why did he choose tongues, unknown tongues, this strange gift? You know, I, I, try, I try to always be clear when I'm just offering opinion. I'm going to offer you some opinion now. My personal opinion is that the modern church lacks power in part because this gift is neglected. It's neglected because it's been so often abused and misunderstood. But that doesn't justify neglecting it. These men and women began to speak on their own 
It, it's not like God took them over and, you know, his words began to pour out of their mouths. That's not what we're told. They began to speak. It's just that when they began to speak, they began to speak in languages they didn't know. They didn't understand what they themselves were saying. It bypassed their intellect. It came from the prompting of the Holy Spirit within them. You know, the Bible is clear that every believer is promised this baptism of power, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible is also clear that it's essential for the fulfillment of of our mission. He told those guys, you know, the, the 11 remaining apostles and the others who were with them, don't leave Jerusalem. Wait in Jerusalem until you're empowered, until you receive this promise that I've told you about from the Father. Now, I want to remind you because we there's no way that, that, you know, as we're going through the, this part of the book of Acts, we're, we're not going to take the time to really do a deep dive into this subject of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I'm encouraging you to do it on your own by watching those 12 videos that, that Pastor Chuck did, you know, I think it's back in the, in the 90s or early 2000s in the School of Ministry. But the link is available on our Calvary, Miami, Calvary Chapel, Miami Beach app, because this, this is a subject, it's so important. We are going to, we are going to go further next week. We are going to dig a little deeper next week. We are, you know, going to, um, going to try to unpack the subject of the gift of tongues, because it's a confusing, controversial subject, and I, and I know that, and no, we're not getting weird. Nothing's changing. You know, like I've told you before, you know, it, it, it's, I'm, it's a gift I'm super grateful for in my personal devotional time. I believe that's where the Bible teaches it is primarily to be expressed in our private time with the Lord because, the, the, you know, the Bible teaches us when a man speaks in an unknown tongue, his spirit speaks mysteries to God. It's not preaching. It's not prophetic. There's no message in, in tongues that we so often hear about in the charismatic church. There's nowhere in the Bible. It's just not scriptural. It's like the thing about being slain in the Spirit. You don't find any example of it in the Bible, none whatsoever. Um, what we clearly see in the Bible is that tongues is just prayer. Uh, we'll talk more about that next week. Um, but I want to ask you a question as, as I bring this to a close. Um, Is there any area in your life where you, you, maybe you're stiff-arming God a little bit? Maybe, maybe you got like a do not disturb sign on, on that corner. You know, it's like, no, nah, I'm not. Cause, and, I, and I'll tell you why I'm asking that. Because I, I've encountered people. I've had people say to me things, you know, like a, a concerning the gift of tongues or, or, you know, like the exuberant worship, raising your hands in church. I've had people say to me, nah, that's not for me. As, as, as if basically they're saying to God, nah, I'm not, that I'm not willing to do. That I'm not willing to be open to. Listen, to, I mean, think about that. Think about that. It, don't you want to be open to anything that God wants to do for you or do in you? Don't, don't you want to be open to anything? Now, I know, and you know, I used to hear it as a, as a young guy. I would hear people say, eh, you got to be careful about opening yourself up like that. Well, no, that's, that's, that's blasphemy. What do you mean you got to be careful about opening yourself up to your father? You got to be careful about opening yourself up to God? Jesus himself told us that's not true. He, he tells us in more than one place that your father in heaven is a much better father than you and I on earth. He's like, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? It's, it's, how much more? 
don't be afraid of opening your heart to him. Don't be afraid of opening up and just saying, listen, I want whatever you want for me. If you have a gift for me, please, I, I, I want to be open to whatever you might want to do in my life. Can you just tell him that? Let me pray for you. Father, I, I pray for those who are watching right now, who are watching this video, Lord, that I pray that you would help us to, to be open to whatever you want to do. To not close off to anything. To, to not have any kind of roadblock, any kind of do not disturb sign or anything like that, to, that, that, we would be, that we would be completely open to whatever you want to give us, to whatever you want to do, whatever, whatever you have for us. And that we would trust you, that you're not going to make us weird, that you're not going to just take over and embarrass us or make us do stupid stuff or anything like that, but you can be trusted. Help us, help us, God, to just look at what the Bible says. Read it for ourselves and, and trust you to give us an understanding and instruction from your written word. Father, I, I ask you for a, for a true outpouring of your Holy Spirit in my life and in, in the lives of those who are Calvary Chapel, Miami Beach, that you would overflow us with your Holy Spirit, that you would fill us, baptize us anew with your Spirit. And that you would make us your witnesses. That when people see the love that we have for one another, the love that we have for our neighbors and our coworkers and our community and, and even our enemies, that they would recognize immediately that it's not normal. That there's something not natural about what they're witnessing in our lives. And Father, I pray too for the ones who are watching this and they're crying out because they, they know they need you and they know that they don't know you. They're aware that there's something lacking inside them and they, they don't really know what to do or what's required of them. I pray for them right now. I pray, God, that you would make them to know your love. That you would make them aware of your presence with them right now, wherever they are. That they would sense your presence and your love. And that they would choose to trust you from this moment forward with all that they are, all that they'll ever be, that they would entrust their future to you, to lead them, to transform them, to, to do what only you can do in their lives. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen, if, if I was just talking about you, if you're just, you're sitting there and you've been crying out, God, help me, I need you, I don't know what to do, I, I'm, I, I, whatever it is, maybe you're just confused about life and you're wrestling with what steps to take and, and you know, maybe in this, maybe you've lost your job, maybe you just don't have a clue where to go from here and, and you, you've been crying out in desperation for God to help you. Listen, I, I, I want to reassure you of something. You don't have to measure up. The Bible says you never can. The Bible says no human being, no human being can ever measure up 
because God's standard is perfection. Now, now stay with me. See, he is absolutely perfect. But the good news is that what he offers is perfection. You see, the Bible says he loves us so much, so completely, so perfectly, that he sent his only begotten son. He sent Jesus to be executed for our sin, for our crimes, to, to be executed for the failures and the flaws and the imperfection of humanity, to pay the penalty so that it's, that's done. It's all been taken care of. So now any of us, messed up and imperfect as we are, any of us, we can come to him and, and say, Father, help me, change me, and he will. Your creator will recreate you. It's a process that begins in the very moment that you surrender yourself to that process, into your, into your father's hands. When you, when you say to him, okay, I, here I am, I'm, I'm gonna trust you from now on. Do whatever you wanna do in me, change me, make me new, transform me. He, he, he begins to do that. How does he begin to do that? He begins to do that by breathing into you, by putting his own spirit inside you making you a part of the family by putting the essence of his being, his spirit inside you, giving life to your spirit. And that process of transforming you in your innermost being, it, it begins in that moment. And one day, according to the Bible, it'll be completed. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to finish it. He will change you. You can't change yourself, change your behavior. You can modify some things, but you can't, can't really change the core of who you are. But your creator can't, your father, he can do that. And that's what he's offering you. So that one day when he's finished with everything, there won't be any more evil. There won't be any more sin. There won't be any more imperfection. Everything will be perfect. That's what he's doing, because that's what he wants for us. Now, if you're making that decision, yes, that's what I need, that's exactly what I want, will you please just send me a note? You can you know, send me an email, pastor at Calvary Miami Beach, or, or if you have already looked into our app, if you've done that, I hope you have so you can watch those videos, then you can, the best way is to send us a message through the app, because that way you can, you can give us your information, let us know how to pray for you. You can give us your mailing address, because I want to send you this little book, 30 days, uh, a 30 day practical introduction to reading the Bible. It's free, I didn't write it, this guy named Nicky Gumbel wrote it. Uh, he's a pastor in London. Um, I don't know the guy, but I love the book. It's just one of the most practical, useful little tools that we've ever had for helping people get started reading the Bible for yourself okay so we'll send it to you for free not a gimmick not gonna you know send you this for free and then start asking you for money every other day like I'm you know been anyway we won't do that to you okay but send us an email and let us send you the book and listen if if you're struggling right now if you have questions if you have prayer requests reach out to us reach out to us we're we're praying for you guys, and um, whatever we can do to, to, to try to be there for you, we'll do our best to respond, okay? But you, you, have to let us, you have to let us know. Now, wherever you are, please stand to your feet again, and let's close in worship. Mountain are still being moved but he's are still being right God we believe yes we can see it. wonders are still what you do we are 